we call this town hall because we in the Virgin Islands, we're an amazing, beautiful community, but we've, we've long faced a pandemic of, of gun violence. So what we wanted to do was gather a cross section of Virgin Islanders to address these issues. We have Benny Demas, multifaceted entertainer, one of our USVR musical ambassadors. We have Dr. Celia Victor, who is with the Bureau of Corrections. We have Senator Vice President, yeah, Vice President Senator Myron Jackson. We have Pastor Gil Monroe, and we have Police Commissioner Trevor Velenor. Thank you so much, guys, for being here, for taking the time out to address what's going on. Um, before we begin, before we begin, I wanna, I wanna call some names. Thus far, we've had 16 homicides in our territory. And I would like to address these names and have a moment of silence to, to, to digest what we're facing here. Ray, Th Th Ray Thomas, age 34. Ferdinand Marshall, age 46. Diasi Shiverton, age 22. Jaleel Ward, age 32. Carlos Inglis, age 23. Andrew Montero Baki, age 25. Mikhail Dorr, age 25. Jaquim Santiago, age 28. Malik Graham, age 29. Malcolm Francis, age 23. Luis Perez, age 23. Deshaun Harrigan, age 44. Michael McKee, 42. Junior Akeem Freeman, 35. Shaquille Roberts, 26. Mm. Bertrand Gilkeys, 26. My best friends, Damian Phillips, Ronaldo Thomas, Senator Jackson's father, Hugo D. Jackson. Let's just have a moment of silence for these folks. When I read those names, they can't just be names. We've had five homicides in one week in St. Thomas alone. Um, we have two young people here, Kerwin Williams and Lisa James, Alicia James. We wanted to hear from you guys. Kerwin, we're going to give you the floor because you are the future, which is indeed the future. You come from the Thomasville, Bavoni area. What do you think growing up as a young Virgin Islander is, is, is the root of this, is, is causing this? Um, good afternoon, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. For me and my personal experience, <clears throat> I feel as if like the root of this negativity, I, was, I would say it begins with the adults, the ones that's older than us, the ones that was here before us, you know, because we was once young. We have we look up to those people and see what they're doing, and then we feel as if that's cool or we have to be like that or anything about that. As far as I'm concerned, I never look up to those type of people because I have a father, I have a mother, and I see the things they're doing, and I compare it to the things that the outside people are doing, and I and I choose on base of what I want my life to be. So, if I see if I see something negative. And not, and not all things, not all things that people do is negative. But if I see something that's pertaining really negative, and I can see that my life is not going to level up into that type of situation, then I'm I'm gonna not do it. I look at things like recreational stuff because that's that's kind of negative. Because for example, if I see a swing set with no swings, what what are the children gonna play on? They're gonna go out about, they're gonna run out about. If I see courts that's not refurbished, that's not, you know, not 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 playable, not not to be played upon, like it's gonna have a bunch of negative stuff. You're gonna have a groups of people not even playing on the basketball court, but doing all the other kind of stuff that's not even like right. You're, in my you're a junior in college right now in Monroe College. What what life changing experience moving from St. Thomas to mm. to where you're at now? What do you think was one of the drastic differences where you saw okay? we may be missing a key element that's fostering success on the mainland as opposed to growing up on St. Thomas? I would say the opportunities. 
as my first time in New York, um, I'm going through college, I could see why people want to leave the Virgin Islands. And not just for New York, but just to just the whole mainland. There's opportunities out there that I feel that the Virgin Islands not doesn't really give out to the youths, but gives out, but in the mainland, they really they really like care about the the youths and like they try to uphold those kind of things. Like for instance, like jobs. There's a like if I compare the jobs up there, especially the like how much money they make on minimum wage compared to the Virgin Islands, it's it's uncomparable. So I kind of see why people want to go to the States and build a career, you know. That's a, that's my opinion. Alicia, what do you think? I think it's a culture of violence and lack of opportunities in St. Thomas and they should have more strategies that address the structural problems in the family and the community. Hmm. Benny, we grew up in Freedom Roy. And for yeah. me to listen to these young people, maybe what, 20 years removed from when we were growing up, that sense of, we're a beautiful place. I, I always believe that, that God stopped when he was creating our islands, literally. How, how is it, these pockets of despair exist because Benny, you traveled the world with Akon, you've made your imprint. What would, and, and, and you speak on how you, speak on the things that you got involved in and what kind of caused you to go down that path per se. Well, as I've told people many times before, in Freedom Hoy especially, and well, with a lot of different neighborhoods, it's always a one way in, one way out situation. So the kids that's walking from in the neighborhood to the bus stop to go to school and coming home from school, they have to pass by what we call the turf. What you're seeing on the turf is pretty much what we will consider our superheroes. These are the people who are glorified. These are the people who are exciting. These are the people who have the money, the cars, the jewelry, the nice things that we can physically see. So these are things that are very enticing to kids, you know? So when I was coming up, I used to always wonder who exactly were our politicians on island. I didn't know, I didn't really tune into exactly who was our governor. I didn't, I was always taught that the police is some people that you move away from instead of trying to be closer to or talk to or any other type of stuff. And the ones that I encountered during my times was pretty much like the, the, the SOB, who we, who we used to call the jump out crew. Yeah, you know, yeah. so there was more a uh, fear or an anger towards law enforcement, or when you seen like a politician or someone else, you felt like this was just someone wearing a suit. You know, there wasn't so much to say relatable to what we were seeing every day going to and from school. So for us, it was easier for us to be able to gravitate towards these people here in the neighborhoods who were, or even at the parties that you will go out to or any nighttime events and stuff like that. These are the people that you will more gravitate to because you've seen them on an everyday basis. You knew them name by name. Uh, uh, even, even to the other gangsters and other neighborhoods, you knew their name ringing out much mm -hmm. more so than the politicians or the police or whichever the case is that you should be trying to know on, on a better level, like you, these are the people that you really needed to be aspiring to be like, you see what I'm saying? So I know that a lot of things like that had changed when I ended up moving off island and becoming who I became in the musical scene. Same for a Rock City, for Simmons, Pressure Bus Pipe, Tim Duncan, and so on and so forth. Because now the difference became that we all became those names that you knew ringing out in all the neighborhoods, just like the gangsters were. But wait, now our names are ringing out in a different light. So now you're seeing a shift came where people started gravitating towards what we were doing okay. so much. So, you know what I mean? As far as musically, now you have a, a lot more musicians, you have more people trying to 
um, get into sports because now they're seeing the dreams that, okay, you can be a Tim Duncan or Roger Bell or Janelle Sorrow or Calvert White. You could be like them and play professionally wherever you go. You know what I'm saying? So we have to really take initiative as being the older folks now, as Colin was saying, and we have to really start implementing ourselves much more into the north, into the neighborhoods and the communities. Because if we allow the kids in the, in the communities to only see that one perspective, it's always going to be lost. And that's what was happening to me. I only seen that one perspective for the longest time while I was coming up. And eventually, I had to make a conscious decision to try to implement change in that. And it's, it's interesting you say that because in the Virgin Islands, right, we are not only isolated politically, but geographically. So what I'm hearing here from a lot of, from Kerwin, from you, Benny, is that our kids are what is lacking a, a bridge to see an alternative idea of success. Because in a, in a space that's people in the hood, people, people desperate, you, you're gravitating towards tangible wealth. Dr. Victor, how does this, in a sense, economic and educational disenfranchisement affect the mental well-being of our young men? That Because, be, you know, depression is something that, that is exhibited through tears or busting a gun. Depression and rage is, is, is linked. So how do you see on the mental health well-being of these young men? Where does that come into play, Dr.? She's muted. She's muted. Un unmute yourself. She's okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. We, okay. okay. Um, I think when I listen to Kerwin and Lisa, um, they kind of laid it out for me. Um, first of all, it's called experiences. Adult, I mean, individ the individuals that you called out, the, the, the deceased, who have passed away due to gang violence or violence in general, I heard the age ranges, but they didn't get to be young adults by themselves. They were once children. And so when you start out in middle school, kindergarten, um, high school, experiences shape who you are. Now, the challenge is if you have good experiences, as similar to myself, when I was growing up in St. Thomas, even though my parents were immigrants, my community championed me. Mm. Um, ben, he just mentioned something very clear, which I like what he said. He said, when we were growing up, I didn't know who the governor was, even though I know the governor's name. Mm. In, 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 our, in our eyes as children, the principal was the governor. Your neighbor was the governor. Um, your past was the governor. And so I remember we used to, you know, we used to do the Pledge of Allegiance we would have to stand up and sing the national anthem of the VI. Yeah. Um, that became a sense of pride. So even if you didn't have, it was a collective consciousness. And so the science shows that the reason why individuals end up with violence is because of adverse childhood experiences. These experiences could be something simple as having a, a parent that's abu abusive verbally or physically, could be a parent or a, a guardian that's neglectful. These experiences, if you get them over and over again, they're enforced. So the people you trust are no longer your family. You're trusting the person that's going to give you hope. Now, that might be the person in, on the corner. That person may give you opportunities or say, you know what, well, have $5, get some food. Or you know what, you know, have a cell phone. Let me see how I can hook you up. So you begin to gravitate to people or individuals who they feel will give them a sense of relief. And so I think that that is part of it, knowing your history, knowing who you are. Because growing up, we understood the importance of Black history, Caribbean history. Um, and even though we had influences, like, you know, we had people who still, you know, we had, we still had guys who were arrested. My little brother was always in trouble, but Miss Carty, Miss Lynch would deal with he. That's about mine. So I think when you have teachers 
who are like family. And I think now with teachers struggling right now to pay their student loan, their mortgages, they have more than one jobs. A lot of stu- teachers may not have time to have after school programs and be apart and stay and tell the students stay afterward and we go over algebra and geometry and reading and writing with you. So a lot of youths in, in the Virgin Islands, their mathematical scores usually are not on point. Their reading skills are not on point. And what I challenge them is you are tomorrow's historians. You are tomorrow's leaders. And so the, the conversation, I will turn it back over to you. But that is my initial thinking. We have to combat these adverse effects. And we're not going to combat them by one person. It's going to be, it's, it's going to take a community effort and having families be empowered to understand what parenting means and the role of parents and how they, how they inter, integrate with the community and the community knowing what their roles are and how they can contribute to empowering the use of the Virgin Islands. Mm. That is what I have to say at this time. Pastor, Pastor Rose. Yes, sir. Historically, the church has been a haven of opportunity, of refuge. We're gonna, we're gonna directly say this. I've always wondered, Pastor, in every disenfranchised area in, in the US, where, wherever you go, there are tons of churches. But every Sunday, right outside the corners, there's bloodshed, there's pain. Where do you see the church's role in this new contemporary society that's saying, folks, you got to get out the pews and go mingle and touch the people? Where do you see the faith community, the faith leaders historically finally addressing this issue from the grassroots ground level? Yeah, and uh, thank you so much, Peter, and everyone on the panel too as well, and to everyone in the Virgin Islands and wherever you're listening. And again, my, my condolences and my heart, my prayers goes out to um, all victims of gun violence. Um, everyone that I grew up in Tutu with or RSDS Height in St. Croix who have lost their life. Um, really and truly, um, my heart is with the family and of course the pain that we see of our young people dying in the Virgin Islands. But I think that uh, as faith, as the faith community, um, you know, even, even um, now in, in New York City or in the Virgin Islands, the faith community has a specific role to play when it deals with gun violence. And I think that the community needs to understand the role that the uh, faith community needs to play as well. Um, we are, um, the faith community has always been the organizing agency in America, whether it's the Civil Rights Act, whether it's um, the right for women to vote, um, whether it's the Moral Mondays, whether it's, um, uh, you can just name Black, Black Lives Matter, the young lady who co-founded Black Lives Matter, uh, she did most of her work right here in the basement of my church um, on immigration reform. Uh, so the church have always been on the forefront. And when I say church, I mean also to the faith community. So as faith leaders, you know, life for us, it's, that's a moral thing for us, um, the sanctity of life. And so what we have been working on with faith leaders is for them, the faith leader themselves to understand their role when it comes to gun violence, because it's really a situation where the faith community is trying to figure out what could I do and what is my what is my my what what is my give in this arena it's just not, it's not just about praying but it's praying with our feet what do I mean by this it, I mean that we must be able to care for people even after they have died we have to be able to that we care for young people um, in our communities when we see the suffering that we advocate for better schools that we advocate for the disenfranchised and the form and the poor among us that our voice that we lift our moral voices that if there is corruption in the police department, that we deal with that. If the police department is not being funded at the right level, that we also advocate for them too as well. Our, advocation, our, our advocacy is around elected officials, making sure that they also pass bill that is just, that is moral, that really looks to the community that who are the least among us and pull those up. Not just giving us a hand up, but really pulling us up by the bootstraps. So the faith community um, our approach to dealing with gun violence is multifaceted. It's being a voice advocating, but it's also street level engagement with young people on the street, bringing programs to the communities, whether it's through our food pantries, whether it's your after school programs. And so again, the faith community has a big role to play when it comes to gun violence. Senator Jackson, as 
You're on mute now. Uh, let's uh, unmute you. Yes. Senator Jackson, as a lawmaker, as a policymaker who is with your, with your colleagues responsible for shaping the course of the lives of US Virgin Islanders, I want to directly ask you in sincerity, as a Virgin Islander that's 39 now, listening to these young people speak, it seems when Dr. Celia said, you didn't identify with the governor. And I can remember that. In the Virgin Islands, we're an amazing community, but we pretend, I don't think we pretend, we, we have a fragmented reality of income inequality. When we hear young people say, well, the governor, the senator, in my cubbyhole, in my corner of Bovoni or Frieden Hoy or Ras Valley or Tutu, these people were like, figments of my imagination. As a lawmaker, how essential is it for you to draw this community in instead of as a segment saying, hey, we're not included. We're not included in the resources. So because of that, I wake up every day as a young man, these communities, I'm frustrated. I have no opportunity. So every day is repeating like a sad dream. So it means I don't mind shooting you because I don't like my life already. What policies are you and your colleagues trying to instill that to build the morale of a generation that says, I want to live because I have something to live for? Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And again, good afternoon and to the those viewing. And I would first like to also uh, uh, give honor to those who have passed, especially to gun violence. And also in memory of my, my dad, and I know my family has, is, is part of this this afternoon. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this discussion, this conversation. Uh, as policymakers, and I mean, the, this is the 33rd legislature. And if you go over the legislative history, uh, you would find uh, various initiatives uh, that, that speak to curbing crime in the territory. The inequities in terms of uh, equality in terms of our ability to teach our children and to give them a sense of identity and belonging and what it means to be part of a community has changed drastically over the decades. Dr. Victor spoke to when she came here as a child with parents who were immigrants and was embraced by a community. That sense of belonging has been lost and efforts uh, in the through legislative mandate, uh, through education initiatives and and also uh, recreational initiatives, we've moved from uh, really strong neighborhood community centers. I was a product. I'm a product of Hospital Ground. I live in Hospital Ground. As a child, I went to uh, the Winston Romo Center after school, and it was my haven for my summer. And today we have parents who question about sending their children to that same center because of gun violence and their activities around it. You have individuals who have decided that they do not want to come into the community and communities uh, throughout the territory to include, uh, I'm, I'm speaking a uh, comprehensive. So there are many pieces of legislation that have attempted to address, like for example, early childhood education that we need to start at a very early age uh, from cradle to grave, the passage of legislation to afford Virgin Islanders the opportunity for higher education free at the University of the Virgin Islands. That was one of the most recent pieces of legislation. Uh, the funding to nonprofit organizations uh, the last legislature, we got criticized for uh, putting monies into nonprofit organizations that these were our, our uh, pet projects, so to speak. And if you look at uh, gun violence in the territory and the advocates for it, uh, we have close to 100 organizations that are struggling on a daily basis, trying to do their part in making a difference. And when we make policy to, to provide funding, and of course that is 
depending on what is available and how those resources are allocated. Um, it requires a community conversation for all of us. What are our priorities? This is going to be education on our youth. Are we going to make sure that they know their history and they're engaged culturally in terms of their identity? And I believe if we do um, work in these particular areas, they'll have a stronger sense of identity and, and a sense of belonging and a sense of community and a sense of their existence that God has created them to, to fulfill their lives, not to take someone else's life. I, you're I muted, Peter. I can't hear you. You're muted. As someone who has been directly affected by, young, by gun violence, I think when our young men just react, I think what they're not understanding is you're not only taking the life of somebody, you're forever leaving an imprint on a mother's heart, on a brother's heart, on a sister's heart, on a community's heart. Um, I've never fully gotten over the loss of my friends. How has that been for you losing your father and the, the unknowingness of why it happened and who did it. How has that come to shape your consciousness? I, I have to say to you that I really struggle with it. Um, I, I continue to struggle with it. I mean, it's 1982 and it's like yesterday. Uh, the bill that um, I am proposing um, with the assistance with the university and the support of the University of the Virgin Islands and Pastor Mel Rose, which is bill number 330126, which creates an Office of Gun Violence Prevention under the Office of the Governor, is my contribution to this discussion in reference to transforming uh, this community and getting a handle on the quality of life on our young people and then providing a comprehensive approach to how we deal with gun violence in the territory, not just when it happens, but every day, every moment of the day, there'll be a response to, for prevention, educational opportunities, training, skill sets, collaboration, intervention, trauma, um, and the like. So I've been traumatized and, and, and other families in the territory have been traumatized. I think the greatest, uh, misgiving and deficiency of the Virgin Islands government has been its inability to make resolutions and resolve uh, open cases in this territory that um, you could say we have dozens, probably hundreds of unsolved cases if we go back and that's 1982 for me and we're here in 2020 and we're talking about unsolved uh, cases. It, it, it's like the book is closed and the key is thrown away. So there is no closure for many families. And as a result of that, the emotional baggage that victims carry or survivors of victims carry in this community is part of the mental health uh, question that we also need to talk about. And it continues on a daily basis, whether it's through gun, gunfire throughout our, our communities that you can't sleep and you, 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 you don't have a peace of mind uh, to sending your children out just to play or for their activities, sending them to school, you know, families leaving and going out to events that they'll come back safe into the home. That's, that's not the Virgin Islands and, uh, that, that we should live in. And it is small enough we have a population small enough. We have a community that's small enough to, to really tackle this problem and to deal with it. And we keep kicking the can down the road. If it is the pandemic, and I call it the true pandemic, COVID-19 is not our pandemic, gun violence is. So I have had to come to terms with really dealing with my anger and to put it in a perspective and to put it in an energy that is productive. And as a result of that, I was afforded a seat in the legislature of the Virgin Islands. And I continue to be an advocate against gun violence in this territory, no matter what the, some of my critics may say. 
I speak about it on the floor constantly, of the impact of it, and to ask my colleagues to move Bill 330126 so that we could have a comprehensive approach on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, as it relates to gun, combating gun violence and gun prevention in the territory. So we suffer silently, and I could speak for the many who don't have a voice, that the emotional baggage that we carry, I don't think many in the community fully understand. Thank you, Senator. Can everyone hear me still? Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I'm having a technical, if you can't see me, but you can hear me. Um, Police Commissioner Trevor Villano. Um, I was moved by your, your words, Senator, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm upset that during this, 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 this moment of such an important discourse <laughs> that I continue to have difficulty tech wise, but bear with us because I guess you don't need to see, just, we just need to hear me. We Commissioner. see you, sir. Okay. Yeah. That's true. Because I, I'm, I'm wondering what's going on. I apologize. You're good. Keep on moving. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner, when you hear us speak, the weight on your shoulders has to be heavy. I've always wondered what it's like to be a law enforcement officer. But I've always wondered more what it's like to be a black law enforcement officer coming from the environment that you're tasked to help heal while being so directly connected to it. How do you see the role of community in addressing this problem, working alongside you and your team? Uh, Peter and um, panel, I say I'm, I'm privileged to be here with everyone today. And uh, you started out uh, having a moment of silence for the 16 individuals uh, who were killed in the territory to this point. But really and truly there were 17 individuals killed in our territory. There was an individual who was killed a couple of days ago and was found near Cremus Park in St. Croix. The interesting thing is, is that uh, he didn't have any ID on him. And to this point, he has not yet been identified. So you've identified those who have a name, those who we recognize, and we have one more person that we need to identify by name. But as of today, we don't know that person's name. So to answer your question, I'd like to just kind of give a little bit of a, a backdrop to this. As I heard people talk about um, the issue of, you know, just long-term violence in our community and some of the reasons, you know, I heard um, Benny Dimas talk about walking through a certain community and, and having to make decisions, right? I heard individuals talk about uh, resources or not having enough uh, to do uh, for our population um, and being exposed to different environments that gave us light and so forth. So as an African-American, a black man who is in law enforcement, particularly in these territory of the Virgin Islands, the mass amount of bodies that we see are reflection of me. There are people who look like me. There are people who are essentially my family members. There are people who have the same names oftentimes that I can relate to. Somehow we're connected in some kind of a way. When we look at our last name or the environment that they're killed last night, there was a shooting incident in Harbor View. Again, that's the community that I came from. That's the community that raised me. And as Dr. Connor talked, Dr. Victor talked about, you know, um, coming up uh, to parents from elsewhere and yet being impacted by a community. Those are things that we talk about, right? Is how we can make an impact. So in law enforcement, I don't see a me or us against you or them. Truly from my perspective, we're one small community where really and truly there's not a distinction that I find. Now I know when you see someone in uniform and I think someone indicated the jump out crew, um, come on out to your saying, okay, those are the police and we create some distance and that type of dy dynamic. I've been here now approximately nine months and I have yet to hear one person say to me that they've been too much policing in our community. 
In fact, I've heard a total opposite. I've heard people say, we need more policing because we need more policing for the exact reason that Mr. Jackson pointed out. We have so many you know, unsolved, unresolved issues and concerns and crimes that you know, many of our people can't sleep, cannot sleep comfortable. You know? So it didn't take hospital ground to have uh, you know, five individuals shot in a very narrow five day period, two or three day period actually, and three individuals killed in that period of time. It didn't take other areas of the territory, whether it be in St. Croix or elsewhere, being shot for us to recognize that we have some major challenges. I've heard people talk about education. I've heard us talk a little bit about the, um, the economic divide. You know, I've heard us talk about um, the parenting challenges that we have. You know, we've talked a little bit about you know, just options for our, um, our community and educational standards and so forth. But I've also said that as much as policing is important to a community, we oftentimes cannot police our way out of this. It really truly takes a multidiscipline, multi, you know, engagement of the community. You know, I have a saying that I use in the police department and most of my uh, commanders, if not all, they know what it means when I say we are PAC, P-A-C. It means that we're professional, we have to be accountable, and we have to be more effective in our communication, P-A-C. And what it means to me is that there's a lot of that bridging of the gap that we need to solidify in the police department. And it comes over time by rebuild and trust. Trust isn't given to you, it's earned. And we recognize that it is earned over time, right? And so, but it takes one act for someone to lose trust that they have worked tirelessly to develop over time. And so one at a time, so as I heard, you know, you know, Senator Jackson talk about his father's death in 1982, and other members of our community who called me to readdress the unfortunate display of violence that have adversely impacted their community. I take it personal. I'm angered. I like to hear anger when it comes to us recognizing that we've had shortcomings and we've had failures. If we haven't solved these crimes, which we haven't, a lot of crimes we haven't solved, just to put in perspective, last year, there were in our territory, 43 homicides in our territory, 43. The year before that, it was 45. The year before that, it was 53 or so homicides in our territory. But I still have to say, but last year, we solved, we had a 40% arrest rate for homicides in our territory. You know, it doesn't seem like going in the right direction, but it sure is. Because if you looked at it the year before, the year before, you're looking at about 17%. So in terms of the work that we're doing, we're doing some good work, but we need more. And we need to solidify that relationship, building that relationship between policing and, community, and, and the community. But we're never going to arrest our way out of this situation. It really yeah, takes well. a comprehensive approach to this problem that we have, which is gun violence in our territory. Yeah. Alicia and Curran. You guys have heard our leaders speak in speak with passion and concern. How much belief do you have in your how much how much do you believe in the future of you as a Virgin Islander living in the Virgin Islands? Alicia. I do see a drastic, drastic change coming. I don't, I'm not gonna give up on the law enforcement officers or the change that there is to come. But time and time again, we have to think about the primary reason that people use weapons. And we're not, we're not to you know, segregate community violence and school violence because most of the violence that occurs in the schools are community problems. And the presence of weapons in schools, I think each concern must be addressed and there must be a comprehensive response to solve these issues. Do you have faith that we're gonna solve these issues? Do you believe we can? I, I do, in fact, I do. Kerwin, what do you feel? Um, on my perspective, I feel that the Bonnie Islands, especially with the younger generation, has a lot of talent. 
I feel that in y'all's shoes right now, there will be re there will be replacements. It will have high um, higher people with making decisions in the in the Virgin Islands. So I have hope. Because I never expected this. I thought the first thing when I graduated from high school, I thought I was going straight to the army. But then I felt that I was following my parents. So in a sense, I feel that there's different callings for people, but it's like they're not listening to it right now. So, but I do sense that there will be a better time, a better days for the Virgin Island people. We're going to move to accept some questions from our audience. And I must say, I must say, um, I have a question from someone very, very, very special and very, very dear to me. And that person is none other than my mother, my 76 year old mother, Anita Bailey, who was a retired nurse um, at yeah. the hospital. And I remember growing up and she always, she would come home crying sometimes because she said, I'm tired of seeing these young men come home in the emergency room, bloody and dead and, and shot and gone. So she asks, what advice can you guys give to a mother or a father to help them protect their children from gun violence? Secondly, should a parent in some way be held accountable for the misbehavior and the deviance of their child? Senator, you wanna address that? That's a big question because uh -huh. it requires the community as a whole. As a policymaker, of course, we talked about laws, enforcement, uh, gun, gun laws, and we, we are on par with the United States as it relates to that. Yep. But this, this bill uh, for the Office of Gun Prevention, I believe is a beginning start to a response to your mother's question of how we collectively approach, how we collectively on a daily basis deal with our young people, our community, mm -hmm. and making them safe communities so that when a mother, when a son or a daughter says that I'm going down to Harris Court or Pearson Garden to play and, and uh, to play basketball or to visit a friend or in Tutu, Mon Mamdiju, Fredericksted, Christiansted, uh, Pine Peak, wherever in the Virgin Islands, that we have a greater sense that our children are protected by the community. You take a village to raise a child. And we have to go back to that. And as I stated earlier, we are too small a community not to have this to work. Bermuda has been tackling similar issues and have been very successful in reducing gun violence as an active approach to our community's engagement. So yes, I could create more laws or the legislative body, the governor could pass executive orders, but it requires all of us collectively to handle and not to turn our back. And parents who are not responsible for the actions of their children knowingly that their children are in hanging out with the wrong crowd, likewise, and not uh, making sure that they are law-abiding citizens and that we are able to provide the assistance like through Dr. Victor and the work that has been doing in all the nonprofit organizations and all the community organizations and leagues and, and cultural organizations that have come about trying to provide outlets for our young people and the little league games when you go to them and you don't see the parents and the bleachers supporting the little leaguers. And, and likewise, when you go to parent, uh, the, the, the PTA meetings and the parents are absent, it's our collectively, we, all are we. All are we, all are we. Police Commissioner Villanoa, we have a question from Sarah Burke. Kara Burke, I'm going to make sure I get her, her pronunciation right, of, T, of TV2. She says, and I've always wondered this too, uh, Ms. Burke, I've always wondered this too. If the VI doesn't have gun factories, how are all these guns getting into the territory? 
What is being done on the national home front to ensure that guns don't get into the territory? That's a very good question. And uh, in fact, I had a conversation a few nights ago uh, with the senator, and we kind of talked a little bit about that. We have very, very porous borders here, right? And, um, and we know that in the United States, the mainland, which most of our guns in our territory obviously have a nexus to the United States, there are over 300 million firearms in the United States. There are almost as much guns as they are people, right? And so someone alluded to the Second Amendment, the right to bear arm and so forth. Even though we're a very controlled environment, very restrictive relative to firearms, you have to have a license when you come here uh, before you can actually pos legally possess a firearm and so forth. We know and we have made many arrests, uh, whether it be VIPD, local law enforcement, Port Authority, or the federal agencies, with people secreting guns into their stuff flying into the territory, secreting them into their um, goods being shipped into the territory. We have investigated these time and time and time again. And so one of the points I like to make is that, you know, and going back to your mother's question uh, in part is, if the overall scheme of things, typically there are very few things that go unnoticed by somebody. And yet we have to have the, the responsibility of self, the consciousness of self to do something about it. And something as simple as saying something could resolve a matter that could become catastrophic, but for if we said something. A lot of the gun crime that you find in our territory, it's not that one person concealed it and nobody else knew. Somebody else knew they saw something and elected not to say something. And I think we really got to get past this whole mentality of not snitching, you know, uh, and, and taking, a, taking somewhat of an ownership in terms of the ability to at least talk to the person out of the situation, talking them out of the situation, engage in someone, whether it be a pastor or police or, or somebody else to tell them, hey, we need to address this issue. As much as we talk about, you know, politicizing certain things and saying, hey, it's very important to have this to be able to address that. Most of the impact that the black community has had in every community has really been grassroots. It didn't take laws for us to execute and do the things that we need to do to safeguard our community, right? And so it really took us being responsible citizens, responsible members of our community, you know, that made certain tough decisions, which was call out on calling out our folks who are falling short and, and loving them, yet doing the responsible thing by encouraging them and holding them accountable, right? And again, as it relates to the parenting, I think that's so, so important. And the Senator pointed out the whole issue of folks not coming out in certain environments and supporting their very own children, right? And so if you're not supporting your children, a lot of times as they grow, you're not even exposed to the things that they're having access to, to include firearms. These firearms are secreted in, in, in parents' homes quite frequently. People are leaving their homes to go to events to utilize these firearms. So yes, as much as I would like to say that there is a big movement from a national perspective to, to curb the, the gun trafficking and gun flow in all communities, I will say whether it be the Virgin Islands or elsewhere, we've obviously fallen short as a society, as a community. I don't care where you are. You've seen the, the adverse impact of gun violence. And it's been because people have possessed these firearms irresponsibly. You know, and I, I like to say this to, to kind of bring this home. I was in Orlando that fateful day in early summer when you had the Pulse nightclub shooting. Folks, I saw carnage that I did never, I never thought that I would have seen even as a law enforcement officer. Yes, I've seen a couple bodies, you know, whatnot, but to see that amount of bodies of just potential laying there that was in some cases, not yet tapped. And those individuals were, were killed by again, gun violence. You know, so yes, it's a big picture. So it's, it's no one answer to it, to the question of the gun flow, as much as we trace these firearms and try to investigate them, uh, you know, and so forth. We do recognize 
that again, our borders are so porous and they're coming in here, but when they're here, you know, we can do something about it quite frequently. We can hold our colleagues, our neighbors, our sons, our daughters accountable and redirect them with a little bit of mentorship. I'm gonna open this question up to everybody, this next question. I'm gonna let you, Benny, um, Pastor Monroe's, and the young people and Dr. Celia. Um, this question keeps coming up. So it's a lot of people have asked this question. Um, basically, music, our culture, the music our kids listen to, this new culture of hip hop, this new culture of gangster music. I remember growing up and although we are geographically removed from say Watts, where Menace to Society was filmed, from Brooklyn, where Biggie Smalls is from, because of the climate of disenfranchisement, income inequality, a lot of our kids in the urban areas just gravitated to that content. I remember me and my junior high school friends formed a group named Strap, trying to mimic the life of Ice-T. Um, Benny, as an entertainer, is the onus, is the music, and that content, is that, is, is that the corrupting factor of our kids? Or we need to fix the social conditioning, the social environment that's giving that content life. Is it, you know, is it, does the egg come before the chicken? Is it the music that's corrupting our kids? Or is it we need to fix these issues or these young men won't have to rap about killing each other? Well, 100%, I would say, no, it's not the music that's creating the issues. I, When I created my music, and my music had a lot of violence in it, my music was pertaining to the violence that I seen around myself and in my communities. That's mm -hmm. what I spoke about. I didn't need Compton or Watts or Brooklyn to do any. I, I don't know about any of those places. I'm not from any of those places. I have Freedom Hoy and Long the Field and Tonki and yeah. Savan and I have those things to be able to talk about. I don't need mm -hmm. any of them other states, cities, mm -hmm. or boroughs for me to be able to talk about a violent issue, right? So once again, as the, the previous question, when they asked about how, how are the guns getting into the island because we don't make the boats, planes, we don't manufacture the guns, but they're getting there. So if it's like a child, if you give a child a toy, more than likely the child is going to play with the toy. So if you give these kids these weapons, more than likely they're going to use the weapons because that's what they have in their hand to be able to play with and, and move around with. I'll give a quick story. Some years ago, I came down to St. Thomas for the um, summer men's basketball league, which was being held over at BCB. Now, before I entered into the gym, a uniform. Keep in mind now, no name, but a uniformed police officer stopped me before I went inside and pulled me to the side so he could speak to me. Now the officer said, Benny, I come into you with this situation because I think you're the man for this. At that time, he was speaking about the Tonki area. He said there was a lot of violence that was going on in the Tonki area and he found it to be um expressive to tell me that he thinks it would make sense for me to go into the community to have a conversation with the people of that community to hold down the violence reason being is because of course him being a police officer there's a very big disconnect with the police and the streets me being in entertainment and now being who i am I have more of a connect with these people along with having to connect with the law enforcement. I fall right in the middle. So he found it in need to tell me that he feels I should go into the community to talk to the people up there to hold on the violence, the gun violence that was going on because he said, I mind you now, I'm telling you straight from what was being told to me from a uniformed police officer. He said, <laughs> they are not going into that community because in their minds, that's complete suicide. And why is it suicide? Is because they are, they have a, a Glock 9 or whichever it is that the, the police use on their hip, in which holds 12, 14 maybe shots. 
But these people in these communities are holding 200 assault rifles. So for them, and the way, of course, the way Tonki is designed, it's a uh, building up in the air and looking down to the road type situation. So they themselves don't want to drive in to the community because they feel that would be suicide for them. But here they are feeling like, but Benny, it's cool if you go in there because they respect you and they'll have a conversation with you. So again, when I spoke earlier, there is this disconnect with the police and the people in the streets. There's a disconnect with our government officials and the people in the streets. We have to figure out once again, the root of the problem. It's not just going to, I'm not just gonna say it's the people in the communities. The root of the problem is how are these things getting into our territory? Mm. As the commissioner said, the borders are not as good as we could have them, <laughs> right? So we have to figure that out. This isn't to put a blame on the commissioner because he's just there about nine months now. Although he grew up in the community, so he knows, he sees, he's been involved with what's happening in our communities. He has some sense of it. Same thing for Senator Jackson. He comes from the community, so he knows and grew up on what we would sometimes say is our culture, sad to say, right? But we have to be able to get to the root of the problem and we can't always blame the street guy or the street, the street people for the violence that's happening in our communities. And another thing that people don't address, well, many times they don't address, is the mental issues that come into these situations, the PTSD. It's always okay for a police officer in America to, to shoot an unarmed black and they get to go home with paid leave because of their PTSD. But what about the impact of the people in the communities? What about the children that seen someone get shot? I've seen many people get shot. That in itself shaped the way that I think or that I thought for a long time. Now it took for me to be, for my mother to remove me from the situation after she found out that I was involved in a situation. She removed me from St. Thomas, sent me away to where I could be in a different environment. I was able to be exposed to something new and different. So again, these are another set of issues that we don't address in the Virgin Islands, the mental health issues, the PTSD that people in the communities are dealing with the way that they feel, the way that they react to certain issues. You know, Senator Jackson himself could be a, a, a victim of that because of what happened to his father. Indeed. But as you see, at some point he decided and said, you know what, I'm gonna stray away from going in this direction and I'm gonna go into the political direction. But that had to come with some form of education. He had to remove himself from being on island, go away, learn something new, like myself, seeing the world and being able to come back and implement that into the islands to implement that into the communities. As, as a product of Tonki, I, I would like to speak on this too as well. Um, grew, sure. up on, grew up in uh, building, building 8. Um, listen, I, I, I never realized how dangerous like my childhood was hmm. like back then like you know Tonki playing basketball in Bavoni um you know um Ras Valley Tonki wherever you you know we had balls um Al McBean and what have you but listen the police department can only do so much when it comes to guns and so I, I would like to talk about the fact that we want to be able to build um a support system in place that we don't want to blame anyone. I, I know that parents, that some of them doing the very best, especially uh, single parent um, moms. We see them all the time in our churches and our, you know, we, we support them. We have people who are in gangs um, or crews or cliques or criminal enterprises uh, within our congregations um, across the board uh, or someone knows someone or someone has a brother or some situation. But one of the things that we have to create in the Virgin Islands is that we got to kill the appetite to use a gun. Because I tell you that there's a lot of guns. I mean, when I was growing up, I, I definitely saw guns and to, to hold, held guns 
guns were just like anything else, but coming on cruise ships or wherever they're coming on. But we have to create a, a culture, a new culture in the Virgin Islands that tells a young man that if you are a young lady, if you have a culture or if you have a lifestyle, whether it's hip hop or whatever you believe it is, that is going to get you killed, then that lifestyle is no good for you. Whatever it is, whatever the lifestyle is, whether you think it's true music or what have you, calling ladies B's and, and H's and what have you, calling you know men the N word and what have you. So whatever lifestyle that you are practicing that is going to get you killed, it's not a good lifestyle. And so we support the police department, but I want to tell you that the police department can't take all the guns off the street in, 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 in any major city. Um, so one of the things that we have to do, we have to create a culture that if a young person have a gun, that we want to give them opportunities that they don't use the gun. And, you know, I did my first funeral in New York. A young man got killed, um, you know, one block away on the same block of my church. And so I had about 300 young people in the church after the service done. I was walking through, guys were smoking or what have you. We don't tell people in our work in Brooklyn or, or definitely in the work in the Virgin Islands that you need to leave the gangs. That, that is not, a, that statement doesn't make sense. But what we do to them is that we want to give them a job that they work so hard that they're so tired that they can't hang out on the street, right? Um, and one of the things he said to me is that, do you have a job for me? I said, put down the gun, you know, do something constructive with your life. And he was like, do you have a job for me? At that time, I didn't have an answer, but we do have an answer now. So what I would say to about the gun situation is that the commissioner of the police department can do as much as they can do. But on the back end, we need to create a community that when people have a gun in their hand or in their house, they will choose not to use it. And that's what my focus is on in the Virgin Islands, creating that new culture that if you have a, a Glock or a machine gun, that you will not use it. That was so powerful, Pastor. Kerwin and Alicia, the, the, the content, the musical content. You know, we always hear people say, man, what are these young people? I thought you were going to ask them if they know, if they ever saw a gun or if they know where to get a gun. Yeah, yeah, but, but it, exactly. It's, 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 I'm, 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 I'm gearing it to, we always, there's this generational divide. Where we say, man, these young people, are they scary? Are they going crazy? Hello. Kerwin and Alicia, Alicia, how have we become more violent? Is the content and the material you guys are seeing now at your age making you more aggressive? Or it's always been there and we weren't paying attention? Kerwin, no, I, would like to, I would like to address that, that question. Yeah. It is definitely not the music. Because I like that question, like it was, I felt like it was so, it was so directed to music. I'm like an open-minded person, you know? So if you talk about the music, you're gonna talk, I want you to talk about the movies you watch. I want you to talk about the gameplay. I want to, I want to hear that, I want to hear the music because everything's a business, you know? So if this, if this topic is making me money and this movie is making me money, because just like everybody else, I'm going to go on Netflix. I'm going to watch a movie. And whatever content it is, that's the content I'm going to watch. Um, parents bring their children to movies with that same content. So it's like music is far from it. So I don't really want to hear that. I feel like what I like what Pastor said and what Benny said is the, it's basically the, the effort of using a weapon. You feel me? Because like, for example, if someone walks in my home, right? Someone just walks in my home. I'm listening to, I'm listening to you guys. I'm like, I shouldn't have a gun, but this guy has a gun. How am I going to protect myself? You know, because a gun, because people, because guns don't kill people. It's people kill people. You know, so it's like you have to, you have to understand like, music is just definitely not, not it, because in a sense, I have to defend myself in some situations. There, there are people who want like to hunt animals just for like the sport of it. It's just, mm -hmm. the, it's like the mental style about it. You know, so the music is basically a reflection of what's going on. Like Benny said, basically, we got to fix the social conditions that's inspiring this type of content. Alicia, Peter, what uh, Peter sorry, I just wanted to a clarification. You said that guns don't kill people, people kill people. Said that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Okay, so I, I just want to say to you on that as well. Um, a gun is the only um, instrument that if you use it exactly how the manufacturer tells you to use it, it will kill someone. So a gun is an instrument to cause harm, maim, or kill someone. I just want you to know that. Okay. Yeah, but someone has to pick it up and use yeah. it. Yeah, but the so way the why it's created, what, what it is to at, kill somebody. Kerwin, what we're getting at, and I think, Ben, you understood what I was saying. We're at this fork in the road, right? We're saying that 
there when I look, let's just be what it is. Mm-hmm. When I listen to the radio and I hear a lyric that says, I'm gonna shoot you in the face, I don't want to hear that. But I am open enough to understand what has caused a creative artist, someone who has a God-given talent, to use that talent to say, I'm gonna shoot you in the face. So what I'm saying in the previous question was, do we address the social conditions? Because music is derived from what people see. As a writer, as an artist, music, your content is inspired by what you see around you. An artist basically expresses what he sees. So the question is, what comes before? Is it the social conditionings that's causing this content or is the content causing these issues? Alicia, how do you feel? I personally feel as an upcoming artist that it's not just the music, but to be honest, I I feel like it has some kind of influence. Some rappers and artists write about gun prevention and some rap about their hurt as to why they feel the need to engage in street shootings and what's not. Music can serve as a form of influence, but I feel as a young person myself, they thrive to portray the lifestyle of the rappers and artists that they look up to. It might not be good content. So I'm not saying the music promotes violence. I'm not saying that's the root cause of it, but it's not going to stop bad behavior or poor social outcomes. It's not. That's Dr. Take Victor, we, 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 we spoke, we're speaking a lot about the trauma. Uh-huh. And like Benny said, like everyone said, somebody could have a, a, a knife. A knife can be used to peel a mango and enjoy that sweet fruit or it could be used to stab somebody to death. Why are our young men choosing to use these tools for what they're using it for, which is to end life? Mute, you're on mute. Okay, hello? Yes. Okay, so I asked this question, the same question you asked, I asked the question to a couple of youths that I, I know. And the first answer was the lack of empathy of life, the lack of sacredness of life. That was one of the answers. Um, And these are 20 year olds, 19 year olds. The lack of values, what do you value? Because that's the bottom line. I mean, music is an expression of your experiences. And as I said earlier, if you grew up in in an environment where you see a lot of stress, toxic stress, violence okay whether in the home or outside okay you are going to tend to continue to in harden that behavior you're going to start looking and hanging out with people who believe what you believe um and so we need to look at the root cause is what do you value what is our community of the virgin islands value what is that what are our parents value back to what your mom asked um, does a parent have a responsibility? Yes, they do. Because when you're two and three and four, your initial imp- impression is based on the caregivers that take care of you. Um, so if your mother and father are, uh, are being violent and expressing themselves or, or communicating to, to aggression, you're gonna think that the way to communicate is through aggression. That's the bottom line. Um, if you see, if you learn that there's another way to have a difference of opinion besides force, and you know, you're gonna you're gonna have an argument. And I think that that is to educate young people from the beginning. I know that I heard, I've been listening to um, the commissioner about the gun. That's the that's the that's the that's the outcome at the end. Yeah. That's when someone has, for example, you grew up in a, in a community that looks at violence, you look at how you're gonna protect yourself, your coping mechanism is a knife, a gun, whatever you have, because you want to protect yourself. So your whole body is on a fight or flight response. And usually your body is supposed to be in fight or flight if something is coming against you. But after a while, your body is always going to be in a fight or flight because you're going to always feel your back is against the wall. You're going to always feel, I got to look at my back. And that is what you have that PTSD, toxic stress that a lot of youths or young people grow up. So until you find a mentor, until you find a teacher or a pastor, someone that says, whoa, hmm. there's another way. 
we are a brother's keeper. What does that mean? I'm beginning to engage with youths. I ask the youths as well, what do you think the problem is? It said communication. Our parents don't listen to us hmm. and we just listen to our peers. Hmm. So they expressed that to me and I said, communicate in what way? They said, when young people have brought up feelings and emotions, whether school, on the top, they just feel to go to their room, put their earphones on, shut out. And that's how they're going to cope. And they said, it's a responsibility for the parent to come to us, not be afraid of the answer they're going to get. Um, and I think that that is part of it. What do you value? Do you value life? Everybody hurts. Everybody bleeds. So what do you want the community to look like? Because the way I think about it, and I told them that, if you can create a VI, what would it be like? Because that's what, that's what I think about, the end game. Um, and they kind of said, where everybody have a place. Everybody have opportunity, whether it's education, the arts, Everybody had a place they can be heard. They have schools and playgrounds and places to go to learn to swim, play ball that look clean, that look inviting for them to go. You know, having opportunities. Um, and so I think with your mom, parent, parenting is key. Mentorship is key. Mm -hmm. The key, faith is key. Mm -hmm. With God, all things about what is God to you? Because I ask my youth a question. Tell me about church. Well, we don't, you know, church, Dr. Victor. Well, you know, that's a lot of hypocrites. Talk to me, because I want to hear what they are saying. Mm -hmm. Well, we look at church that we are not religious. We want to people to accept us for who we are. Pay us to nose, pay us tongue, come into coming to the building with with with, 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 with with my gear on and not be criticized. They'll be real with me. So, so these are the things that. I think we need, to, we need to ask the youths more questions to begin to really look at what change on the front end, the prevention, the mental wellness. If we don't have an adequate mental health system in the Virgin Islands, how dare we, okay? Mm. We're gonna take one final question and I must say, this is, um, I'm, I've been sorry, I've been reading all the comments and reading all the comments and I'm so inspired because I think one of, what I think um, I'm moved by this discussion is to see this screen and a cross section of Virgin Islanders who have just taken their time out to address this, to care to say we are a family. And having said that, the final question comes from Luana Sue, I'm bad with pronouncing names, with sure. Luana Sewer. And she's, in, she's a native Virgin Islander, and she is in Charlotte, North Carolina. And on the topic of you know, our young people having access to exposure, access to constructive opportunities that can show them the way that can create a bridge to their dreams, because we tell kids to dream, but if we don't bring them the dream and show them the dream, and it's not tangible, people can't imagine what they've never seen or experienced. I can't imagine being a doctor if I never met a doctor that doesn't know one exists. So she asks, what type of programs are being utilized for mentoring, trade and skills building and esteem building for our young men? There are federal dollars for these types of community programs, but there doesn't seem to be much of an investment in youth programs these days. Police commissioner um, or Senator Jackson, do you wanna address that question? Yes, I, I would say to you that we have shortcomings as it relates to uh, investing in our youth, especially our, our young men. I mean, efforts have been made in the past and my brother's workshop, I, I think is the, the best example of a NGO, uh, which also uh, receives uh, federal and, and uh, territorial funds, well, most of territorial funds, I could speak to the territorial. Uh, for um, its operations to some degree. It, we, we should be able to give them more in that regards. And again, the question is where does our priorities lie in reference to how do we invest in our 
in this. And that's why I feel very strongly that the, uh, I advocate under the office of the governor on a daily basis, we can deal with some of the uh, issues relating to how do we connect the dots? How do we provide all of the necessary services? Now, I, the, the reality is that we have limited resources, but if we work together, we could conquer the deficiencies. And we see a very engaged community and Pastor uh, Monroe could speak to that in terms of the, the collaboration as an NGO working with faith-based communities and the many um, activities that we have in the territory. How do we transform the lives of our young people? The way my brother's workshop is an excellent example of how it can be done without the bureaucracy. We've talked about trade schools. We've invested in a uh, trade school in St. Croix, the, the complex. And there again, we have issues regarding getting teachers into the classroom because we don't pay them enough. Um, professionals don't want to come into the classroom uh, for various reasons. And at the end of the day, they said that they're not, you know, the salaries are, are not, um, high enough for them to come into the classroom and we have to deal with that. We have um, activities through sports and providing us uh, wellness and sporting activities that are recreational facilities up to grade. And that likewise, the ability of our young people to compete and we, you know, baseball league, softball league, football, soccer, cricket and the like. And I have to say to you that for a small territory, we are remarkable in that we go around the world and we come back with all medals, gold, bronze, and silver from this little community. And the same with arts and entertainment. Yeah. Without cultural centers that support them, we, we produce some of the finest musicians and artists and sportsmen and women. So we can do it with the limited resources and really focusing those resources in the right areas, we can do it. Police Commissioner, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I'm just going to kind of reemphasize something that I heard Kerwin say earlier. Kerwin talked about passing by a park and seeing a swing, but there is no actual seat on the swing. So therefore, with the lack of the ability for a child to sit and swing, the park is utilized for something other than its intended purpose, right? And so we see a lot of that in our territory. We see a lot of, in, in spite of, you know, the, the will and the want to do certain things, not having the resources right there for us to literally encourage and essentially swing that child, you know, push that child who's seated on that swing. So when we look at the bigger picture, right? The question is, what do we want for our community? We keep saying the same thing over and over again. We've had many of these dialogues regarding, hey, it's kind of like listening to, I believe the children of the future back in my days, right? And you look for that opportunity for uh, the, the, these children and you say, okay, well, who's given us that opportunity that we so badly want? And so as we talk about um, grants and resources out there, it's not enough to just get the resource. It's something when you get it to now start to really implement a maintenance plan because we've built swings before, but now what do we do about maintaining the swings, right? What do we do about putting up the lights so that kids can really have a little bit of an extra play time, you know? And part of that, I come back to many communities that really do it right is because it comes down to literally the members of that community taking a vested interest. Those areas where you see, even in the territory that are vibrant, that are doing very well, it's by and large because people invest in their community. They've taken a, a, an interest in doing some of the small things and talking to their neighbors and say, let's paint our block, one block at a time. And how that resonates. 
you know, how folks literally take the bull by the horn and start doing things for themselves. We recognize that we go to the government and we look to the government to do certain small, small things to allow us to grow. But like I told the senator when I was up in um, hospital ground the other day, I say, Governor, I'm, I'm sorry, Senator, I said, Senator, as much as the, the, the gunshots are rolling down here and you haven't heard any for four or five days at that point, I said, really and truly people in the community deserve not hearing gunshots. I said to him, it's so important that folks stand up and be counted. We all have a right to say to our neighbor, stop that, that's not right. And some of our neighbors, they would heed our, our guidance. Some of them won't. Uh, you know, so as I started out saying earlier in our conversation, in spite of the resources, we're not gonna lock our way out of this process, but what we can do is forge that relationship. We can build that relationship between law enforcement, the faith community, and all the other community groups where we're having impact. So when I heard someone say, there's that swing without a seat, it's tantamount to having a basketball court, but nobody can play on the basketball court. So guess what? They're gonna find another game. Hmm. There's another game to be played. Even in that basketball court, you're gonna find someone's gonna put a bench out there and they'll be doing something else. It might be shooting dice or some crazy mess, but then that's another problem that we have, right? It might be sitting there playing dominoes. I remember, and most of us are on the table right now, we've actually traveled outside the territory for an extended period of time. Maybe we got exposed, educated, or whatever it is, in a different environment in terms of formal education. But when we left home, we left home with a recollection of a particular tree where people hanged out on there. And then some of us came back 10, 15 years later, and there were still people hanging out under that same tree. And where the tree was cut, where they chopped down the tree, people then assembled on chairs that they brought from home to bring <laughs> to where the tree was to have social engagement. So I, saw, I say all that to say that when we start investing into the community, we also have to have that maintenance plan. We also have to have that reinforcement. So I love the first question I believe Peter asked both uh, um, Elisa and, and Kerwin was, do you guys see yourselves as the next leader? Do you, do you see that coming? And I love that because you're it. You're, I mean, I, I'm seeing talent, I'm seeing projection, I'm seeing potential, I'm seeing just a vision that many of us, truth be told, probably would not sit on the panel tonight to have this discussion when we were about 19 years old. So I really appreciate just your insight, your valued focus. And I'm gonna leave today just thinking about that swing without a seat, because I think that really kind of sends the message clear to me at least. We're, we're gonna wrap up the town hall soon, but it's so amazing. The comments are just flowing. I mean, wow, we're amazing people. It, it, we really care about our home. And th that leads me to something real quick. You know, where do you guys see because I think the general theme of this whole discussion is we have to build community in the Virgin Islands. We lost a sense of community. We lost a sense of, okay, if your kid down the street, auntie so-and-so, uncle so-and-so is gonna check that person. He's gonna look at this whole street is gonna make sure if we see a kid that's wandering, we're going to address it even if the parent isn't there. That community feel. I feel that a lot of our resources are also on the mainland. Where do we see the role of those of us from the Virgin Islands who have left and want to build a bridge with our folks that's on the ground? And there's sometimes there's tension where, well, are you as outsiders? Are you on us anymore? There may be people on the ground that says, look, we, we got this. Where do you see this, this, this wealth of resources from Virgin Islanders that are around the world wanting to connect and help address this issue? Benny and Pastor Gil Monroe, can, can you guys touch on that topic? Because both you are in Atlanta, Benny, and Pastor Monroe, you are in Brooklyn. So Benny first. Well, I've made it my duty to keep myself implemented into the communities in the Virgin Islands for years. From me going down during the school seasons to 
speak to kids at different schools, whether it be St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John, uh, myself and Rock City had extensive times of performing at schools and all this is for free and without assistance from or being asked to from anyone else. These were just things that we felt we wanted when we were coming up. So we decided to start doing it as influencers within our community. So I always keep myself engaged with people, not just, I, I, I would always say, not just A and B students, but C, D, and F students need a lot of exposure. They need, they need a lot of guidance, counseling. You know, all of them looking for something from someone. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the violence, like myself, I grew up without a father. So for me, I always looked to a male figure to be like that mentor for me, whether it was Austin Peterson at the Dorican School, whether it was Levi Farrell, my band teacher, you know, whether it was Louis Tombow at Insomnia Nightclub, I just gravitated towards these people. These were like my mentors when I was coming up. Same thing for CB and Kubu, who just passed away. Um, you know, for playing basketball and stuff like that. So I watched the things that they were doing within the community with us kids during those times. And I said, I wanted to make sure that I did my part once I became someone or had a voice within the community. So I always keep myself engaged within the community, which is that why you see I created the Benedimas Carnival kickball game, which brings... <laughs> Um, which brings people from all different walks of the Virgin Islands, St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John. You have policemen, firemen, senators, uh, different community leaders, uh, you know, people who are popular on Facebook, just that the community likes. Mm -hmm. You see them all within one setting. Um, I was able to create that to, to give the, the community a sense of peace, a sense of urgent, a sense of we can all get along in some type of way within a game or within some type of a, a, an event. So that, that's my take. I've always just wanted to make sure I kept myself in the communities and to be that bridge, you know, so if Commissioner Velno needs someone like me to be able to go around to the communities and speak the lingo or whatever the case may be. Um, I've always put myself out there for that. If Pastor Monroe's, um, has seen himself like he wanted to reach certain people that he himself may not be able to reach, even though I know he's within the community himself, um, then we can all work together. You know what I'm saying? So Pastor Monroe could use me as a musical influence to bring in certain types of people. Um, the commissioner can help, can, can use me to bring in certain types of people. Um, the senator can help, can use me to bring certain types of people and bring that awareness to whatever it is that we're trying to implement to the youngsters. Pastor Monroe? Yeah, and I, I'm going to take you up at that uh, kickball tournament one time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, got you, I got you for next year. <laughs> um, well, I, haven't, I haven't been to a carnival. I haven't been back during carnival time for like 20 years. Um, but, but I want to say that we are the only society that I think of, Caribbean country. I, I mean, I'm in Brooklyn and I travel, of course, and deal with so many different people that People celebrate the heritage, they celebrate people from where they're from. We, we sometimes, I feel like we're the only community that when you tell people, young people like, like Lisa and Curran, go away, get educated and come back and help. And then when you go away, get educated and then you come back and say, well, okay, you from a whale, it doesn't make sense to me. Jamaicans twice removed, three generation removed will always say that that person is Jamaican. They will never like say like, no. And, and for me, you know, I'm I'm not no celebrity like like Benny or Tim Duncan. I'm I'm in I'm in a in a pastoral role. I'm a professional pastor dealing with social issues and justice and what have you, social justice. But at the same time, uh, I can't be in New York being one of the lead voices on gun violence, being one of the lead clergy members, and be here and I know that the Virgin Islands of my home have a gun violence issue. Yeah. that I should be able to bring what I've learned to the table in the Virgin Islands. And that's that's my role. And that's what I, I told the governor that, number one, I don't want a job. He can't pay me enough money. <laughs> right? <laughs> number two, 
um, this is my calling. My calling is to help the police commission. My calling is to help the Virgin Islands. I want my mother who is in the Virgin Islands, my sisters, my brothers, or businesses, or property, or church, to be able to thrive. I want my niece and nephew to be able to walk the street and come home safe. That's my that's my passion. That's my that's what I'm called to do. And so for me, my give back to the Virgin Islands is one thing, right? I'll let, my main one thing is that to help the Virgin Islands reduce the gun violence. And the way that I thought to be able to do that was to help write this bill that Senator Jackson is pushing in the, in the Senate to create this office to, to prevent gun violence, to have a place that you can have all of the services into one area. That's what I'm doing here right now at this moment um, in Brooklyn, uh, leading the city um, in organizing clergy members as to how and training them as to how that they can work to reduce gun violence. So if I'm doing that successfully here in Brooklyn, I think that, again, my give back is to come to the Virgin Islands and to come back and do that. So I've been coming back for seven years, training clergy specifically on their role and how to respond, how to prevent, how to deal with gun violence, how to deal with crews, gangs, how to support uh, parents who have lost a children to gun violence, how to support the parents, how to create these org organizations and these help to help reduce the violence that we see in our community. So that's my give back to the Virgin Islands. Um, and I, that, again, that's my calling that God has given me. As we talk Yes, Peter, yes. I just want to interject one second. My friend Rashida yes. Francis. Yes. She just said, up to now, no one has mentioned how to incorporate those who have committed crimes or are at risk for committing crimes to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if anyone can speak to that, but I will mm -hmm. say this, I do know that many times within the community, after someone commits a crime or is known for committing crimes, even when they try to change their lives around, a lot of times people in the community still try to bash them. People still try to sway them away and say, oh, well, you are the type, you're the person that did this, this, and this, and not giving them an opportunity or a chance to be able to, um, yeah. you know, get themselves back, you know, Have a boy. back into the community or anything like that. So. I mean, if anybody could speak to that, she's that's asking. A great, that's a great insight, Benny, indeed. Yeah. Uh, unmute your mic, doctor. Unmute the doctor. Just hit that button. There you go. No. No, you go. Yeah. Um, actually, I can speak to that because I actually worked at Family Resource Center in a program called the Family Youth Intervention Program. It was a program um, sponsored by the Department of Human Services where I worked. And it was addressing, you know, high risk youths in the community, boys and girls, the rights, the rights of passage for boys, um, the girls' rights of passage for girls. And we many times invited Mr. Dr. Emmanuel, myself, Mr. Levo Olini, who's a Pan-Africanism, invited some of the individuals in our community who had been to, to um, incarcerated and was coming home to share with the youths what their challenges were, what their, because I think that's important because they need to understand how did you get where you got? And I think sharing their stories allow the youth to say, okay, wait a minute. Okay, I don't like school, but let me see why or what approach I should take. So I think that's important. That's number one. Number two, I was also a part of Gangs in Paradise. There was a documentary that was done by Lou Lambert, LaBelle Campbell, Save Hood Neighborhoods in the Virgin Islands. Um, and that documentary came about because um, Sierra Burke, who was at the time the coordinator lead one of the lead principals or educator for Iwa or Edith Williams School. And when I went to her office, she had a whole wall of boys. And I said, well, who are these boys? She said, these are the boys who have, who have committed, who have died due to, due to gang violence. And so that documentary came with LeBed looking at gangs in the community and looking at what the root causes were. And a lot of it had to do with parenting, lack of access, um, having access to guns, um, having an issue with the faith base. So a lot of work has been done in the community, but as the team is talking about today, funding. A lot of time when these programs are created, when the program is not funded, it goes away. So at the time, that program was in the VI for about 10 years. And that's a program that a lot of youths to that program went to college, went to the military. So once again, we have done things in our community, 
to uh, begin to address this issue, but it has not been continuing because it has to have buy-in from everyone. Mm. The community has to buy in. The church has to buy in and, and rally as a team. Right. I'm not gonna let this thing go. This is important. And we have to stop looking at silos. Forget the silos. We are all hurting and we have to work together to get this solved and get it done. Yep. Indeed, indeed. Um, as we wrap this first town hall, Rashida, that was a great insight. Our next town hall, we're actually going to invite some of the young men who have been incarcerated, who have actually, I think for you to really, you can't really under talk to someone unless you went through their shoes, unless you walked in their shoes. So this has been the first town hall. And due to your comments, due to my phone just blowing up, um, this has been inspiring for, for me. As we wrap this town hall, I want us to remember we're the only place in modern history to have survived two category five storms. We have already overcome the inconceivable. So this problem with gun violence is not, it's, it's, it's for us, it should be a walk in the park. We face the worst storms history can muster. We put, it, we put each other on our backs. We took care of each other as a community and we overcame that storm. As we, go, as we overcome the COVID storm, we're gonna, we, we have to work collectively to overcome this new storm. So I guess today's common theme, resounding theme is, how do we get back to creating a community? How do we get back to those names of young men that I just called out are just not numbers? When you hear their names, when you see their mothers cry, you cry too as an extended Virgin Islands family. One of my best friends that passed away, Damien, who died, I remember was in Freedom Hall, and it was the year before I was about to go to college. And he said, you know, Pete, I know I'm going to die right here. And I said, why are you saying that, bro? He said, no, I know I'm going to die right here. <laughs> died right there in a shootout with police. And um, a stray dog found his body in the woods somewhere, I believe. Um, so I, as we close this out, I want everybody to go around the, 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 the forum. And, and the question is shortly and succinct and profoundly, each one of you, what is it in one graph? How does the Virgin Islands begin to get back to community? Dr. Mm -hmm. Victor? I would say taking the time out to look at, look for your neighbor, knowing who your neighbor is, knowing who, where the kids are in your neighborhood knowing what their needs are and how you as a person can help them in a small way. That is, that's the first step, reaching out to where your community is and seeing what the needs are and trying to assist with other persons that you know in, in that space. Pastor Gilmore, Pastor Monroe. Yeah, I think that um, community means that we, we are all part of the community. And I think we have to interject ourselves to see how we can get back into community. Mm -hmm. um, community is just not a byproduct of they versus us, or I live in my own particular home. Community is that I want to make sure that my son can walk down the street and get back home safe. And so if I want him to walk the street to get back home safe, I expect that your son as well and your daughter should be able to walk down the street and get back home safe. Therefore, I need to do this not only for you, but for me. So I'm hoping that we can see it that way. Benny? Uh, communication and education. I would say not all, not everyone is able to learn in a classroom. Sometimes we have to go to where the kids are or where these people are. If that means in the community, in the bad community, on the turf, to have educational situations with them or conversations with them, then that's what's needed to be done. So. Um, communication and education, I would always say, is needed to to bring people together. Senator Jackson? I would say Sankofa. Hey! <laughs> and uh, take the best that we have, bring it to the present. Yes. We learn it. That's Sankofa. Right. Police Commissioner Villanueva. I'll just say again, each one teach one. Uh, we're all in this together. We have just amazing talents in the territory. 
I mean, I've seen folks from all different areas of our community that, you know, considering the odds were against them, nonetheless, they rise. And so I say just, we just need to continue to teach each other and elevate each other. If we see something that's not right, we address the issue that's not right. Alicia? Okay, because, sorry, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, because of the mere fact that we can't, you know, discipline mental illness out of someone, I feel like we should address the needs of the youth in the different housing communities and address their mental wellness as a whole. And the one and only Kerwin. <laughs> Save the best for last, right? Kerwin, <laughs> what's your thoughts? All right. Um, I feel like, you know, you should be that 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 mother sister that friend that that person to you talk to you you could be that that person to make that person a better person like just give them advice don't do this don't do that <laughs> and i think that's how we'll get back in other words each one of us could be mentors um as i said this town hall series you know it's it's their USVI. I, I've always wanted to get. I'm a writer, so I've always wanted us to get back to the intimacy of writing letters. And I feel that this dialogue is meant to start a conversation. You know, we like to talk in the in the verse now. We 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 love a good talk. We love a good chat. And I think what would be great if the the topic of 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 of, of on everybody's mind is how do we stop this? How do we love each other? Um. So this is the first, this was the first town hall conversation. I truly apologize for the glitches in this, this tech space. I'm new to it, so please accept my apologies. Um, and I truly love everyone. I, I think this thing starts with love. My father died um, about a, September 3rd, about a year ago. And he, he, I always remember him dreaming and saying, son, we can create the society and the world we want. The reality that we choose to create is what is more real than the one that's presented mm -hmm. to us. Because life is definitely a story. And if we don't right. write our story, others will write it for us. So on that note, I appreciate everyone who has joined this first Town Hall Live. Um, I've been reading the comments. Um, and... <laughs> It's wonderful to be, it's a great time to be a Virgin Islander. So on that note, I love you all. Peace and prosperity. Peace. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. God bless everybody. <laughs>